I think we're just, I'm just going to kick off at the beginning because I was looking through your thesis last night, which we'll be talking about more in a minute. But it seemed, it was interesting that you foregrounded there and you foregrounded a lot in your performances and what you said that really your background is incredibly important to you. And I'm actually quoting you back at yourself now because it says here, grown up and educated in exclusively white environments in the north of England has affected the formation of my identity and consequently my art making. And of course, all of our upbringings and backgrounds shape our identity, but it has seemed to really had a very particular role. So it'd be good just to talk a little bit about that, about you growing up in rural North, North Yorkshire. Yes. Um, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to look at the thesis as well. Um, a pleasure. Um, it's something I would like to um, expand and um, uh, fictionalise, actually, um, uh, to avoid any um, legal um, ramifications. But I think that it would make... Um, uh, an interesting work of fiction. Um, but I mean, just, just, to, just to interrupt you, just to say the thesis is called Race and Representation in Northern Britain in the Context of the Black Atlantic, a Creative Practice Project. And we'll talk about that more. I'm not going to slide mm -hmm. over it, but I just think it's interesting that, you know, in that thesis, that, that's one of your quotes. And, you know, it's it just seems your upbringing was, was so important. So if you, if you could just tell me a little bit about it and, sure. and why it was so important, sure. and what impact it's had. Um, yes, I... Um, um, I was baptised Catholic. Um, my mum's family, um, Irish and Welsh, um, paternal, maternal, respectively, and um, my biological father not on my um, birth certificates. Um, we travelled back to Scarborough where my mum was um, raised from the age of seven when I was about six months old. Um, I was born in um, the Whittington Hospital in Highgate. And um, by the time I was four, she'd met my um, stepfather, for want of a better word, and who was a solicitor um, uh, and um, sort of a, a landed solicitor. Um, uh, and we moved to rural Scarborough. Um, when you say rural, I mean, it was really rural, wasn't it? You had no TV signal. You had no electricity for a lot of the time you were growing up. I mean, you really were in the deep, deep countryside. That's right. And he um, had a shooting estate. Uh, so we were in the midst of the shooting estate. Um, his family had bought the estate, not knowing there were any properties on it. They were um, factory owners in Leeds and farmers. Um, they had um, uh, washing powder companies, paint companies, and um, my stepfather and his brother um, used that the land that I grew up on um, originally as a place to um, blow stuff up. So his brother was an um, international arms dealer. Um, oh, God. Who was um, found dead on a plane um, around the same time that Mark Thatcher was um, found in the desert. Oh. Um, so they were um, big friends, John and um, Mark Thatcher. Um, so there was this, it, within that atmosphere, um, my stepfather had been in the TA, so um, we lived in this um, sort of um, make-do atmosphere that was um, also, um, there was this sort of mocking about inverted snobbery. So whilst there was um, money to send me to private school when I was seven. You went uh, to boarding schools, didn't you? When you were I seven? went, yeah. When I was seven, I, I went. I was, I was what was called a school refuser um, uh, up to that point, and 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 that I think um, 
I'm sure many people relate. Um, I, one, I, there was an a, attachment issues with my mother, but also um, uh, at the schools, uh, I'd be like one of uh, the only person at some schools or one of maybe half a dozen um, people of colour. So it was all all very um, destabilising, I suppose. But yeah, so I um, would be at these um, schools of varying um, denominations so that um, some were sort of high Church of England, others didn't have any sort of um, uh, religious ethic, um, were all about status. Um, and then during the holidays, I'd come back and I'd be alone in the countryside. Neither um, Joan nor my mother were um, uh, sociable in that way. So it, it would be us three in the middle of nowhere um, and lots of um, arguing and emotional instability and all that kind of um, fun and games. But your mother drew, didn't she? You did life drawing with her and you've yeah. talked a bit or I've, I've read that she did introduce you to some artists. So yeah. there, was, there was some strains of awareness. Oh, of my word, yeah. 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 So she, um, when Jo and her met, she was doing a teacher training course and um, her long essay, I think they called it, as opposed to a dissertation, um, she studied children's drawing, but she also, um, I remember, was able to um, hone in on artists like Stanley Spencer and Lucien Freud, um, David Hockney was always, there were postcards of, of sort of um, European male artists in, in the home. Um, and mum is a talent, you know, a naturally talented drafts person. Um, and she can, um, she, yeah, she continues the, the one sort of constant in her life is that she, she does get out to do life drawing still. She's still there. So, I mean, from this, this very destabilizing, disorientating, I mean, I suppose when you're in it, you don't realize as a child, although you kind of do at the same time and it comes out later in therapy or whatever, but you know, it was an unorthodox upbringing and a difficult upbringing. And, but somehow you get to the Courtauld Institute. How does that happen? What's that kind of arc? Because, and also why art history and not art practice? I mean, two questions in one, but I think it's, I think that kind of career arc or that kind of journey is really interesting. Um, yeah, so um, I was heavily influenced by my caregivers. Um, I wanted, I had thought that I'd be a solicitor um, and would work in Joe's company. Um, and when I was due to do my um, UCAS form, he explained in no uncertain terms that I was not to do law. Um, so it was a very quick... Why was that? It's because you were a female and because it wasn't deemed to be... Um, I'm not sure, really. I think, um, I think I'd have been too close to... Um, his dealings potentially yeah. um and um my mum's story is that she was a year ahead always um she took her 11 plus uh, a year early so when she came to um apply for um like raven is it ravensbourne and falmouth and saint martin's um they each told her you know brilliant um uh, portfolio but take a year out come back mature a little which she never did and someone someone along the line had told her about studying art history as well as an artist which was interesting and that was only it's only recently that I've remembered that um influence but um my teacher at the local sixth form where I went to do A levels um when I wasn't going to be doing law, um, I, I'd shown a, an aptitude for art history. We'd studied 
um, uh, sister Wendy's um, book. We didn't have television reception, uh, so I didn't know her from off the telly, but um, I would copy um, the um, artist's works that were from a book, and he would use those as, um, he was on the board of um, one of the examination, exam, examining, um, so Sister Wendy Beckett was your portal. That's, that's yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah. And he suggested I study art history. It was completely new to me. I didn't know that um, a subject existed called art history, even though we'd been studying it. But of course, it was European art history. I, I hadn't imagined that I could um, study it at all. And he said, if you're going to study it, you study it at the Courtauld Institute of Art. He said, you won't get in, it's only people from Eaton and Harrow. Um, and I applied and I got in. And yeah, that's it, it was less to do with having any concept of what a career would look like um, and more to do with I, had the means, the luxury to go to university um, and be away from Scarborough. Um, and, and that was the, the um, route um, that I could take, that I showed most promise in. Um, and whilst I was there, I was in constant awe. So I, um, and there wasn't really much um, career. I think it's different now. There's sort of, I don't know about when you were there, but there was... When I was there, it was the dawn of time. But I mean, when I was there, I mean, I don't know how much it's changed from when you were there. You were there, what was it, in, in, in 2000 and... and, um, and, and uh, uh, yeah, 2000, eight, 2000, 2000, 2003. So it was the beginning of the new millennium. But it was still very white, male orientated. They probably slipped in a bit of, you know, a, a few a few Louise Bourgeois or whatever. But I mean, I wouldn't imagine much. How, how was it? Yeah. So there wasn't careers advice after. Yeah. It was like you but did... even the curriculum. What 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 were you yeah. specialising? Um, what did they offer? I um, there was the survey course in the in the first year and then you um I think maybe I was allocated 18th century arts and I also did um uh, renaissance Florentine renaissance art so those were my two second year specialisms and then third year didn't get the grades for um 20th century art with Mignon Nixon that I'd had a, a taster of and loved um, um but I yeah I, it was 18th century art that so, I... so you left London you left London and went to Norwich to do drawings so you know the, um, again that's an interesting arc <laughs> um yeah. and, and and to do drawing at Norwich and 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 yeah. what what what, in, what what why did you why did you want to do that what what was what instigated that move well the chronology is that I left London with my then boyfriend Henry who was from Suffolk and I fell in love with Henry and also um, East Anglia which was just gorgeous and the freedom that his friends sort of um, evoked and, and what happened was I went and studied an art foundation course first. Um, in Norwich? In Norwich which was brilliant. It's where, it was where the library is now. Um, and we seem to have free reign um, in that whole building, uh, um, experimental and um, we could um, utilize all of the technical facilities during that art foundation course. What had happened was in my second year at Courtauld, um, I'd spoken with now artist Francis Scott, um, and um, Frances had sort of made clear that she was going to go and study at Wimbledon, um, incidentally drawing at Wimbledon. And um, that um, choice suddenly became available to me. Yeah. You, you knew, so you wanted to make, you realised you wanted to make. Yeah, but I always had this holding back because my mother was so naturally talented that I'd, I had got it into my head that I could never be an artist because I didn't have her 
natural flair or um, virtuosity, as I imagine. So actually, when I was was at Courtauld, I in my um, halls, I had her life drawings sort of all around me, trying to um, uh, bring awareness to London of my mum's fantastic art. Um, uh, so I was all the time sort of holding back a little kind bit. Kind of slightly hiding behind her art, if you'll forgive me saying, you yeah, know, yeah. Sort of like putting that up of the screen, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you still get to Norwich, you still get there and you, yeah. do, you do the foundation and you choose drawing rather than yeah. painting or sculpture or anything else. Go to Norwich, then I come back to Scarborough and then I go back to Lowestoft where I've, um, I'm sort of destitute. Um, it's got more and more chaotic in Scarborough. I can't help. Um, and I go to Lowestoft and from there I do life modelling at, at the art school in Norwich with an idea that if I've got my foot in the door that I might be able to apply and then they do a course. It doesn't even last my full two years they cut the course when they're doing all the sort of um uh corporatization of the art school um uh within the two years that i was there but that's how i got in to do drawing and and then i was able to um think more conceptually about drawing what drawing could be so we were looking at um, Jeremy Della and um, Franco B and I I did print making um, uh, I explored drawing that way um, uh, as a means I was looking at Andy Warhol and um, Sigma Polker and um, Gerhard Richter um, and so suddenly it opened up in a way the art world opened up but and, and you were making drawings, you were, you were using drawing as a practice. And it was around this time, a little bit after this time that you met Lin Linda Morris was a bit of a portal, wasn't she? Into you making work more about identity, more about race, more less about sort of the conventional, you know, so-called conventional northern art history, sort of highways and byways. Absolutely. Um, and of course, I was in introduced to East International and... Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, you know, seeing John Russell's work in there, and um, uh, I met Sarah Wynn Evans. Um, uh, he'd come in for some flowers for Linda because I was working in East as well. I don't think that that was through Linda. I'd gone of my own volition, maybe. Um, uh, yeah, he bought in these beautiful lilies for, for Linda, who's just passing or something, I don't know. So lovely. Um, she deserves every lily she can get, that lady. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and But he he split them in two and gave me half of the uh, lunch, which I'll never forget. Um, just really kind, because I was working, doing... Um, installing and invigilating there in the in the um but yeah i put in for um uh a, i put in a proposal for a phd at norwich simultaneous to doing the ma and um linda picked it up it was um it, it, it i proposed pleasure gardens wasn't it pleasure gardens and yeah looking at the intersections um between 18th century pleasure gardens and, and contemporary festival culture so linda introduced me then to, um uh Bactin and um hannah arant um and um stuart hall and innova um i might have to put hilda downstairs okay i don't mind hilda at all but i don't want hilda to distract you hilda can bark away Okay. I know Noisy bought it's Border Terrier, isn't she? Border Terrier? Yeah, border my, with a jack. Yeah, my mum, my mum's Border Terrier was very vocal. I mean, it's up to you. If you'd rather put her downstairs, do it. So, but I'm I'm totally fine. Doesn't bother me. She gets on then. 
we'll see how she goes. She can join in a bit more. So yeah, so in a way, then then you then you worked at Innova for a while, didn't you? You worked on the front desk at Innova and you were in a very different environment. Yeah. You know, you, you but also through your resourcefulness. I mean, you were very good at, you know, making things happen for you in in, in ways that were, you know, very very go getty going back to lower stuff life modeling getting into you know so so, yeah. so there you are now now in innova and that that must have been a whole new dimension as well mm -hmm. armed with the information that linda had sort of fed you and a whole new conceptual context theoretical context a context where i guess perhaps you felt a little bit more like you know that uh, terrain that you could occupy comfortably yeah maybe not comfortably but certainly that i wanted to explore yeah uh, and that felt right. So um, yeah, pertinent question from Linda when we met, uh, what's your class? That's, uh, that's a killer question. Yeah, something <laughs> in a spiral. Um, and- So how did you reply to that? Because that's, that's the British class system. I would argue, of course, every form of identity is relevant, but the British class system is often the trumpeting elephant in the room that nobody ever mentions when they're talking about identity. Can I ask how you replied? I will have I will have either mumbled or um, I will have definitely been pretty much muted and said I'll have, I'll have to get back to you. Don't know. But it did set things stirring in your head, though, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It it, it was crucial for me to be asked that. I'm really thankful to her. Um, how I got to Rivington Place was actually I'd gone and done a workshop it wasn't paid so I must have found some money I think by that time I'd, I'd met Anthony Doffe so um not sure if he was paying me money at that point but I'd I'd found my way getting to Bristol to do this workshop I was lucky that my, my now deceased uncle my mother's mother's brother lived in Bristol so I, I had accommodation you know it was a mega jo bus job whatever um but it was a performance um uh a workshop and the good people from performance space now based in Folkestone um uh yeah they'd they they got to see my work during that workshop where we had um been asked to take all our clothes off and even sort of there was wow. even um a you were asked to do that as part of the workshop the workshop was about taking our clothes off and actually again i hadn't elected to be part of that workshop i wanted a different one on paper but they put me in this one and um it we'd found ourselves then with no clothes on walking around taking up space with no clothes on and then we were going outside and taking our clothes off which was you know um during the middle of the day which was something else really but bean um ran that workshop and and then invited me to do a my first residency which was in London and whilst I was there I realized I needed more money I think for me London I, I love and I'd love to live there but the the idea or when I'm in London and I'm poor is just the worst thing brutal London at the moment yeah. certainly. it's just so um I managed to apply to work at Rivington Place. So I was working for <coughs> Autograph ABP as much as I was for Innova um, uh, and Rivington Place, yeah. Um, and you were making, so by this point, were you making, I mean, your, your earliest performances or one of the earlier ones I've seen is, is shadowing Josephine. Yeah. And so you were using your body. You, I mean, you, were, you talked about your body. It seems like you mentioned taking your clothes off for the, for the, for the, for the, for the um, workshop. But I mean, again, you know, in your thesis, you talk about, you know, can making performance and live art be thought of as a, a grammar for a grammar for, for drawing and the body being a medium and your medium early on was your body. Yeah. And and you know, this extraordinary work you did, the shadowing Josephine, several iterations of it, where you learn and brilliantly execute, may I say, Josephine Baker dance routines. You know, I mean, you haven't quite got a banana kind of, you know, bunch around your waist, but you're very much doing doing the ragtime, doing the dancing, 
you're literally shadowing Josephine. What what was the thinking behind this? Why why, why Josephine Baker particularly of all the people that you could have picked or? Yeah. Um, I th again, I think because I grew up with Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, um, Shirley Temple movies, the sort of most contemporary film um, sort of. Uh, 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 um, like that was Annie, which I had on repeat. I, I loved singing, loved dancing as a kid. You danced as a kid, didn't you? You danced in your, in your stepfather's old people's home. You, yeah, you know, yeah. you've been, you, dancing's been, a, dancing and drawing seems to me to both be things that fed through your childhood. I love, life. I love dancing. And it's so good for, you, for one to dance. You know, it's a real, um, uh, it, it can loosen any sort of traumas that you're having, yeah, for sure. Um, and um, so when I learned about Josephine Baker, I was aghast that she hadn't been on my roster of um, superstar um, uh, actors and dancers that I'd grown up with, because of course, the recordings that my grandparents were doing from the television for me to watch because we had a generator which would be on for several hours each night and I could watch a, a, a film and my grandparents recorded all of those sort of um, uh, uh, golden uh, age yeah. movies for me. Um, so I was just pretty, it, it was apparent glaringly apparent to me that um I'd missed out on her because of racism um, mm. uh bias um uh, around what's shown on what they'd curated for me but also um perhaps what 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 was shown on terrestrial television um she was you know um the most famous um black superstar of her day and beyond, you know, um, and it, it's like celebrity today, if there's a whole um, swathe of people that you're not being introduced to, well, why? Um, and it, it became clear that, yeah, I, I was, I had not been introduced to any um, black um, actors um, in, in that way. But but your your shadowing of Josephine, it's a celebration, but it also you're very vulnerable. I mean, you're topless like she was. You also perform that routine. It's a long routine, you know. You are. I mean, you've, you've obviously you, you practice it. It's it's brilliantly executed. But you know, it's a marathon, and it's making you very vulnerable, and you're displaying yourself, and it's a very kind of ambiguous, you know, ambivalent presentation, and. Yeah. There's, you know, you you watch it, and one doesn't feel completely comfortable. You know, it's 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 not meant to, I guess, do that. Sure, I would. I got to a point. I think the longest I've probably um, performed it for is about six hours. But I did um, make a performance that was towards um, making it twenty four hours long. Wow. Um, and um, I'm vulnerable. The audience can be really confused and disturbed and um, uh, I'm, I'm powerful and vulnerable. I'm demonstrating labor, the labor, um, that's required of women to exist. Um, uh, it's countering the male gaze. Um, I, um, I'm exhausted by my own performativity, and actually, that's a that's a real fact of life for, for me, as for for many others. Um, um, we're exploited in this capitalist machine in, in that, that way. And um, 
uh, it, that's what it's speaking to. And you're drawing on also old histories of, of the black body in a performative way, the black body that's been exploited, the black body that fueled the Industrial Revolution. You know, these these histories, I, I think, are implicit as well. In, in Absolutely. This. Yeah. And then, of course, parallel, or maybe I want to just tease out a little the kind of intertwining of your drawing practice and your, you, you know, you, you've called your you've called your drawings performance documents, yeah. and some of the drawings that you've made have been enormous and over a great amount of space, and sometimes you've actually executed them publicly and with no clothes on, yeah. using charcoal, which is dirty and gets messy, and I think I'm right in saying some of that charcoal actually comes from wood burning stoves near where you grew up so you're tapping back into the land again i mean there's so much going on there and of course we haven't even begun to talk about the texts of the drawings because they're text drawings did these develop in tandem with your performances did the performance come first and you know they they obviously are very closely related but i just just want to tease out a little bit more talk a little bit more about that if you could sure i think i haven't ever deliberately um, I never deliberately set out to, to make performance. There was one um, where there's the ironing of my hair that maybe I was trying to um, uh, situate my, or situate performance within my work. Ah, ah, no, lie down. Um, because also thinking about my body as a free tool, um, your tool significantly yeah. you to use how you choose yeah yeah um because also materials are expensive um and the drawing on the walls um again kind of influenced by my mother i'd come back from um for a break from the MA and my mum and her then boyfriend who was a couple of old, years older than me they'd taken a whole load of MDMA and they'd been writing naked in the kitchen um profanities all around the kitchen um so I returned to that um and the the anecdote which they found funny and I found really quite frightening um but when I was then asked and I've got Linda Morris to thank for this um Linda had put my name forward when she worked with cu the curator at Cooper Gallery called Sophia Howe um and they were um uh reimagining a, a series of performances that Linda had curated, I'm not sure when, um, called One Night Stands. Oh yes, I heard about that, yes. Yeah, and um, so they, they were inviting artists to take part in these two night stands. Um, and I was asked, um, and it coincided with, um, me making a spoken performance where I was talking about the body in front of um, Labena Hamid's work at Spike Island. Um, Evan Afakoya had been invited to make and curate performances within Labena's exhibition and Evan invited me and some others who were part of what was then called Network 11, um, a group of, um, a collective of black artists. And that's where I, the, the, the text works that then became No Need for Clothing at Cooper Gallery, I read aloud at, Coop, at um, Spike Island for that. Um, and when, uh, when, uh, Sophia asked me, um, I'm going to have to put Hilda downstairs. A brief Hilda break. I'll have a big break. Going back to talk about text, the, the, the use of text and drawing and performance in this kind of wonderful intertwining 
intertwining skein and you were talking about reading the texts aloud and, yeah. and, and as part of that and I just want to talk a little bit about your choice of text actually I yeah. mean where does it come from I, you've, I think I read some of you saying autobiography memory yeah. Whole composite things yeah I, I, I pick up like a magpie really um uh uh, when I was traveling a lot, I'd be taking notes, overhearing conversations um, as well. Yeah, um, uh, the ethics of that, I'm not so sure about, but um, it, it's, uh, uh, yeah, life is interesting how we express ourselves. And, um, but reading is, um, other writers will influence how t texts arrive <clears throat> there was a basic formula really um for the work at cooper gallery and what went to be called no need for clothing and then it it took on other names depending also on um who i was reading at, at the time so um and you were publicly often publicly there making the drawings not always with your clothes off, <laughs> sometimes with them on, but, but you know, it was part of a kind of in interactive process, it seems to me, too. Yeah. Uh, so did, 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 I mean, obviously you have to plan it out to an extent, but you've got a very particular aesthetic. I mean, you can, can always spot a Jade Montserrat text drawing on whatever scale, large or small. You've got a very particular style, a very particular kind of, it's not really a font, but, you know, there is definitely a way of doing it. How did that evolve? Just the visuals of it. Yeah, there's um, uh, a measurement to do with scale as well um, in relation to my body. So it's a really freeing exercise to be able to write something um, that's um, the same, you know, a, a letter that's the same size of, as you or um, and and to have that um, freedom um, uh, on, on such a, a large scale, which if you... Um, a limited, or if you haven't got a studio, which I I I I, I didn't have at all. Um, I haven't had since two thousand and um, thirteen. This is the closest thing I've had to a studio since then. It was me being able to experiment on a large scale, um, and um, the way I thought about the font or um lettering the lettering um was um yeah uh, again through the through the lettering and fonts in in books um so i, I replicated that i i have got um just happens to be here because i've I'm looking through, you know, I, I have collected a lot of books with different fonts. And then when I've been skinned, I've sold the beautiful books, but photocopied the, um, the you know, and it's something I'm, I'm interested in generally, but I, I haven't developed um, thinking through or, or making other fonts. A uh, court told, you know, um, I, I got to, be up close and personal with the Lindisfarne Gospels in the British Library and um, uh, all of those illustrated manuscripts and um, generally how books are put together, how we disseminate, um, how we communicate. I'm, I'm really into, um, into mirroring that or um, stealing. <laughs> what was it you know Picasso said I don't borrow I steal you know well Bart doesn't borrow takes you know so I think I think stealing is completely fine um, but but also I mean you know you, you make paintings but the drawing does seem to be a thing and using charcoal often from the you know I mean okay maybe it's cheaper to do that from the from the wood stove but, but it is very much you know from the land which brings me on to coming a kind of full circle really back to where you grew up you know back to the fact you're there back to the fact that Yes, you have a very ambivalent relationship to this extraordinary childhood with people blowing things up and shooting pheasants and killing things and <laughs> trapping things. And there you were, you know, watching your watching your, your TV for a fraction of the day or whatever when you when you were home on those rare occasions. But, you know, your your works like I mean, I saw the Body Vessel Clay um, show at Temple Place, you know, that extraordinary film of yours, Clay, the film Pete. 
you know, literally you are in the landscape with your body. Pete, you see your feet squelching through this extraordinary landscape, this primeval landscape, the, the mud between your toes. And then then with, with clay, you're actually covering your body. Again, it's your body, it's the clay, you're in the landscape. I mean, ambivalent perhaps, but also literally embedded in the landscape. Yes. And also, how do you, how do... Um... How do black women confront and counteract um, the trauma of being um, uh, taken from the land, uh, displaced from the land? Um, I think they're sort of also, you're describing um, instinct and instinctual um, communication with the land as well um, that again I've had the privilege to um, explore um, uh, we're kind of cut off I think yeah and do you feel like you're kind of reclaiming it in a way on your terms because yeah. you know, rural England north you know, the North York Moors are not a place to see a black body traditionally, you know, unless it's in some kind of strange labor situation, Absolutely. some kind of aberrant moment where somebody's enslaved property was put to work on the estate or something. And so, you know, but you are a British woman, you're in there, you're reclaiming the land with your body, you're reclaiming the landscape tradition, you're kind of grappling with art history to a great extent, it seems to me. Thank you, yes, absolutely. Um, there's a reclamation um and uh uh demand um i suppose that black women are, are, are recognized as um belonging to this landscape as much as anyone else um uh, but it's also going back to roots so i'm i'm pretty much rootless um and i've had to pick up um, from here and there, uh, sort of heritage-wise, but I, I haven't got those sort of um, uh, lineages um, that help a sense of belonging. Um, and I feel a sense of ownership towards these landscapes and beyond, um, stewardship, and responsibility, um, whereby we can feel um, our power connected to the land, um, but we have to take it. Yeah, a bit. I mean. It's interesting, I was seeing some great work by the artist Elsa James, who does a lot of work about Essex and Essex women, oh, and she's sure. a black Essex woman. And, you know, she was in comfortable country, the most, you know, rather like the more sort of sacred yeah. you know, white heritage territory, reclaiming that. And it's it's interesting and, and really, it, I, I find it incredibly you know, encouraging that, that Britishness, all this stuff's being dismantled. It's being, it's being unravelled. It's being, it's being messed with. It's being interrogated, and it's being reclaimed. So, the true picture of Britain comes through all this kind of, you know, Constable Moors, Wuthering Heights, of course. So, you know, although of course, you know, Heathcliff was was mixed race, or you know, not he was in non non white himself. So you got you got all this stuff, all these undercurrents. I think it's really interesting, and the fact that you are engaging also in such a very direct way. You know, I mean, you are you are inhabiting this landscape in all senses. Yeah, and um, I'm not sure, but it seems to me that um, there isn't really. A um it's a myth the sense of Englishness oh. it's not real it's an ideology and um I grew up in these landscapes that I've made the performances in they're all I, I've known um 
apart from when I've entered outside of it. And again, I've been privileged, but this is an island of uh, migrants so, to a greater or lesser extent. And we have to come to terms with, I, I believe, um, uh, the fact that we're better off for it and ever so, um, that's not going to change. Um, so when, when the premise of our political parties in government, um, when the premise of them coming into power is placed on the other and excluding the other and in and creating these fences and borders um, to protect what exactly? So this is this is a macro a, a macro this is all I can do to sort of begin to articulate that that I hope to develop further. Um, it's, it's not about me, although it is, it's how I'm able to discuss um, from this subjective position that sense of alienation and trauma and exclusion and abuse, which is actually what the English seem to be best at at the moment. Um, and I'm trying to say that who cares about my, you know, I, I'm still going through um, or working through my trauma um, and, um, but being public about that within my artwork, I'm hoping allows me to build the, confidence um, and um, articulate better um, uh, and advocate better um, for others who are experiencing this um, uh, displacement in, in uh, much more violent ways than thankfully I, I will ever um, experience. You know, it's happening as we speak all the time. Um, there's 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 room <laughs> there's there's beauty here Let, we can share it um uh um and i think um if if this these works allow me to talk about those issues publicly then then they've served a purpose um i love making i love it i can't make when I'm in cycles of abuse, however, and that's happening to me on a personal basis. Now, um, I'm in the, the mire, so, you know, but God help us, there's people who just couldn't turn to making at all, you know, when they're, they're struggling to find a way to flee um, war-torn countries that the English have... Um, been an architect of and often provided the arms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so that's, that's what I want to say, I suppose. No, I mean, works. we're here to talk about you and your work, but, you know, there's no doubt that your name has become known over the past few years, over various conflicts with institutions, major kind of establishment figures. And I wanted to ask about, you know, your art being a form of activism and you being an activist yourself. You've just spoken very passionately about injustice, about abuse. OK, so you're not in a war-torn country, but you have experienced, you know, some traumatic experiences over the last few years that, that many people will know your name in connection with and I just wanted to just ask you a bit about activism about that kind of role where now it seems to me you're very much foregrounding your art and your making rather than all this other stuff but nonetheless the other stuff hovers <laughs> like a, a bad smell in the air sometimes I just wanted to talk a little bit about just how you see the notion of activism I think when we spoke earlier you said that you never intended to be an activist this was the psych something that evolved and happened yeah I um no I I 
didn't set myself up to um, be a, an activist and I don't feel comfortable um, with that, but I understand that that's, um, that I, there's a, I, there's a sense of duty, you know, um, I have had a certain type of education um, and I have um, a certain mobility and a certain platform um, and with that um, comes responsibility and I, I um, understand that but I, I'm also depleted and exhausted and I haven't yet made work um, that I just want to make for me so I'm in the process at the moment of sort of um, uh, winding down my social media accounts and winding down um, commission based work so that I have a safety net and then I can start to make um, uh, work from the studio um, and have established some sense of safety security and stability in my life which I've not had in my life yet um, so I because I'm able to I have met some incredible um, allies and supporters, uh, people in solidarity who are go who have gone through similar situations or um, are able to impart uh, onto me um, uh, a vocabulary for what I've gone through. So, um, I mean, um, I probably wouldn't um, have. Uh, uh, found myself in in so many um, uh, abusive situations were it not for the patriarchy having uh, impacted my mother so much for instance and then there wouldn't have been what I'm now understanding as parentification where I've spent a lot of my life um, parenting my mother um, but in, in these abusive cycles so I haven't had several developmental stages that um, uh, hopefully, uh, again, I can advocate for for um, young people um, and recognize that there are these uh, uh, gaps and uh, abuses that we normalize um, because of the bigger picture. Um, and so that's where um, uh, any sort of, uh, uh, semblance of activism comes in but I, I um, feel keenly I'm kind of, I've always been sensitive I think to injustices um, uh, and um, I um, am able to work through those within my work but as I say not latterly um, and not on my own terms and that's what I now have to work on because um, uh, otherwise I'm going to just be repeating cycles where I'm serving others um, and I haven't fully um, returned to my, as Gabor Mate will describe, uh, my authentic self and I'm going to be of much greater service as an artist and maybe an activist if I can finally at 40 years of age return to myself and um, uh, and uh, love myself and what I do um, on my own terms yeah uh, but no I never signed up to be an activist. I want to end up really talking about what you just flagged up there you said I haven't started making the work I want to make I mean maybe I and you can't hold a crystal ball and see what that kind of work is, but do you have some indication of where you're going, where your work's going, what, what you're, what you're thinking about and, and working on at the moment? Yeah, I'm quite, yeah. Um, I have um, these collage books that I started in maybe 2012. Um, one of which is, uh, uh, 
then Prince Charles's book on um, architecture and landscape. So I sort of, I cut them up and I embed my own handmade paper in and then I screen print them. I started this um, uh, technique, I suppose, at Norwich um, and I made some books there. So I want to return to those. The series is called Win Winning Wimbledon. Um, the idea that uh, most of us will never win Wimbledon. So this uh, impossible um, grasping um, and, and um, thinking through memory. Um, my work is influenced by reading. I've got, a, I've, man I've amassed a collection of beautiful books. Um, and now I need to, hopefully, I'm, I'm currently going through EMDR. So hopefully that will, um, uh, uh, some of the impacts of trauma will dissipate and I'll be able to, to receive and concentrate on reading, which will influence my work. But I want to make more watercolours. I've, I've started stretching some canvases. I want to return to oil painting. I want to make a, a much fuller um, film. Um, uh, uh, ideally, I would uh, create... Um, the work of fiction that started with my thesis that would um, link um, these um, uh, diasporan uh, roots uh, from uh, Welsh, Irish, um, Montserrat, um, and um, I, I've my um, DNA makeup is um, West African. Um, uh, so I would link all of those um, uh, th and, and make film. Um, I've also got, uh, you know, years of photographs that I just like to look through. I, I, I'm hopefully um, commissioned, well, I have been commissioned by Rochdale um, Arts um, uh, to make a short film and I might start with some of those photographs. Um, it's in um, uh, in response to Maud Salter's work. Um, uh, so hopefully I will, it, it, I've got six months, so hopefully I can um, get myself together for that. Um, I'd also like to, um, to make more performance, I think, um, it, but, sort of choreographed so I'd return to dancing um I've got a lot of nervous energy within me but I um and I dance in the kitchen or whatever but I'd really like to work with a choreographer I really want to work with sound as well so I've managed to retrieve my piano from Hackness uh, last week actually it hasn't been tuned for ages um it, it was so um I loved the piano I got to grade five formally um but um Joe didn't like me practicing when he returned from work which was when of course I would get home from school when I started day school a bit later and my mum on the other on the other side of the spectrum would hover over me um wanting me to play 30s 40s um tunes and she'd be like come on you're not keeping up to while she sang accompany me so I have this sort of like real um uh, anxiety, <laughs> anxiety like coming but I want to um sample sounds and take field recordings and because I see sound as um uh, 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 sort of collage process as well. So um, in an ideal world, I would be doing painting, drawing every day. Um, I haven't done that, um, well, really since 2016. So that's quite a lo long time, you know, um, uh, that funny um, sponsorship by Anthony. Um, but I did get a lot of work done um, for the, you know, uh, um, but so I'd, that's what I'd really, and also, you know, gardening, that kind of thing, like make a beautiful, beautiful garden. Wow. That's a lot. You've got a lot to do. That's fantastic. I can't wait to see what you make. I can't wait to see more of these amazing ideas coming to fruition. Jade, thank you so much. It's been the most wonderful hour. And thank you for being so generous with your time and your information and your great energy. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for asking me such, yeah, pertinent questions and um, also for being um, so kind and sensitive in your asking as well. Thank you for your interest in my work. Thank you.